so yeah, um, I'm Ben. Uh, my Twitter GitHub handle is binhums. Um, I've got the slides for tonight on my website, so if you want to click on links, follow along, whatever, um, there's a lot of links today, and if you want to follow up, they're right there. Um, so go there. Uh, thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Um, so yeah, I work for a company called Zesty. We're based in Petrero Hill, San Francisco. Um, we're like a corporate wellness company doing catering. Um, and if you're interested in coming joining us, please come and talk to me after the after this show. Um, yeah, so as I say, I'm talking about web accessibility. And what I want to cover today is how websites can be inaccessible, where you can go and learn about accessibility, um, what you can do to like find out if your website is accessible, and some like specific stuff to Ember. Um, where can we make Ember.js more accessible? I'm not going to start talking about like why you should be building accessible websites. I feel like that's pretty obvious, and yeah, I don't know. I don't want to guilt trip anybody into anything. Um, so first of all, how can websites be inaccessible? Um, the first one that like a lot of people think of is um, people who are visually impaired um, will not be able to access the content that you've like put out onto your website for, for whatever reasons. This isn't just being blind. This isn't like full like not being able to see whatsoever. Um, you can have like limited vision. You can be like bad at picking out colors that are really similar to each other. Um, you might have color blindness, which is again like not full monochrome black and white. Um, it might be like you know that you confuse two specific certain colors, um, and a lot of users will be working um, with like a really small screen or a screen that's been magnified. Um, one particular thing that we'll see a lot is that um, when users are navigating our websites, they're like quite often only looking at a small chunk of the website and not the entire thing. So um, we kind of need to be careful that we're making sure that the context is like not something that's absolutely required if you're like zoomed in on a particular part of the website. Um, users might not be able to move. This is uh, specifically like making assumptions about using our website with a keyboard or with a mouse. Um, there's like other things as well, things like touch actions, for example. Um, if we're working with mobile, that's a thing. Um, specifically, a really like good way to work this out is if you try like just using your website with just a keyboard, you'll probably find it's absolutely infuriating. Um, some people navigate web pages through um, switches, either just like pressing a button when they're like, "Yeah, I want to, I want to hit that thing." It just scrolls through the page and they hit a switch, um, or they have like some kind of greater like um, level of mobility. There, you could have like a. a, a a mouse that tracks your gaze as you like look around the screen. Um, so these are like things to be aware of. Hearing, um, like if if you have audio content on your website and the user can't hear, obviously um, they're not going to be able to access your content. Um, the obvious way around this is through captioning. Um, text comprehension is a way that like your web content can be inaccessible um, and. This you know, comes down to cognitive disabilities, learning disabilities, sure. Um, but actually, language is a big one here. Like, If you're you know, trying to look at a website, you don't understand the language, fine. Um, and this can also be like part of what we'll look at is um, how age might like, be a factor in how accessible your content is, um, particularly, like, for example, with mobility. If somebody like, shakes a lot, that's a, you know, that's a way that you can be making your content inaccessible. Um, and similarly, like um, if somebody's really young, text comprehension can be really difficult. Um, environmental factors. So this, it's not just about people being disabled. Um, this can be like uh, particular temporary moments. I like to do a lot of language learning, um, and there's websites I really like using, and I can't use them on the bus, for example, because they involve like some kind of audible component. So I'm just like, I can't use this content whatsoever. Um, so particular examples are if you're in like low lighting, a loud area, you're not going to be able to hear things. Um, 
if you don't want to disturb the people around you. And you know, things like if you're driving to work. Um, I don't know how many people use websites when they're driving to work, but <laughs> it, it came up as an example. <laughs> um, similarly, device limitations are going to like, potentially cause accessibility problems. Um, mobile devices, I feel, um, I don't know. I hate mobile devices, personally, and I feel really old when I say that. Um, but like smart TVs, for example, are a thing. They have web browsers now, apparently. <laughs> right, there we go. Um, so like, people are using all sorts of things to look at the internet, um, cars included, apparently. Um, so sometimes you might be in a situation where um, click events are not a thing, right? It's actually touch events. Um, and similarly, uh, we now have specs coming through for like specifically pointers, um, which is relevant to VR stuff. So I don't know if people browse the internet using like an Oculus Rift or something, but um, that's also a point. You can't just have like quick navigation. Um, On-screen keyboards are a total pain in the ass. They like take up so much space, and they're really difficult to use. Um, and similarly, if you're relying on text-to-speech, this can be um, potential problem. I think, like personally, I really like the idea of um, using like text to speech and speech recognition in mobile as like a way around um, the problems with like on-screen keyboards. But the other thing, um, if like you're working with a support uh, a platform that has like really bad support or really bad tooling, um, this can be a problem. Compatibility problems, uh, your HTML might suck. Um, if you've got invalid HTML, this is like, you know, gonna, gonna be a, a, an issue here. Similarly, like if somebody's using a really old browser or if there's like some kind of character encoding problem, a lot of this stuff is things that I thought were a total thing of the past, but actually things like character encoding, okay, you know, you can just say like, all oh, right, everybody use UTF-8, but actually, for example, um, and we'll get onto this, a lot of devices that people use um, when they can't use like traditional keyboards and mice, um, so, like a lot of them don't support UTF-8 for for stuff like this. So um, one thing is that your user might actually be a robot. Um, this is particularly applicable to SEO uh, for a lot of people. But um, acceptance testing is like a big a big piece of this for me because I feel like there's been a lot of a lot of situations, especially using Capybara, um, where you can um, like try and get your test to pass, and you're like, no, I've put this up correctly, and it, you definitely haven't. And so being able to acceptance test your website is a good indication that it's accessible, because the robot can crawl it. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, people are using more like other technologies than just like your monitor, your keyboard, your mouse that you're familiar with. Um, so it's good to have these in mind when you're building a website. Um, screen readers are um, for people that can't see so well. Um, they'll go through the website from top to bottom, just like linearize the entire thing and just speak it to you. So this is like text-to-speech stuff. Um, some people use Braille keyboards um, and Braille displays, which are really cool. I like, never heard of them before I started researching this talk. And like I say, switch devices um, are other like, types of input. So I don't know if this will work, but um, OK, totally not working. Um, but this is an example of like the, oh, OK, so we can hear it. Yeah, so you get you get an idea. This is how like people browse the internet when they like can't see. Um, it's really annoying. Um, and for me, it's like it feels like it's going lightning pace, and I can't keep up. Um, but this is what people are used to, familiar with. Um, Braille keyboards are so cool. Um, so Braille is like representing regular like letters, numbers as dots, and people like in conjunction with having like a text to speech can like get these raised dots to like come up and down and read braille of like you know their android phone so you can see these dots here like moving up and down to show you where the cursor is i think that's just amazing um, and similar there's all sorts of like technology that people are coming up with to make um, it easier to type 
like using Braille and stuff like that for, I've been generally really impressed with, I'm talking about web as a platform um, and how accessibility applies to that, but I've actually generally been massively impressed with how mobile supports accessibility. I, I've always thought that mobile would be less accessible, but it's, it's really great. Um, so the general theme here for like a lot of like what you can do is if you've got text content, try to provide non-text content. And similarly, if you've got non-text content, try and provide some text content. That's like general rule of thumb. Um, so if you have text, um, non-text that can like, you know, non-text options that are out there, icons, images that like represent um, what you're trying to, like the content that you're trying to put across, they're like great. Um, you can pre-record speech for your website in like, this is actually one of the recommendations from like W3C because the, the current state is apparently that the text-to-speech is not good enough yet. So they, they actually recommend that you record your website um, spoken out. Um, Braille representations of text. And this is one thing that I saw recommended and I, I, I'm not fully aware of the nuances of why you do it, but making a video recording of your text content in sign language um, so this is for sighted people, um, so they can read. But um, that was a suggestion as well, so I'm interested to like, hear more about that if anybody knows. If you've got things like multimedia, images, audio, video, they're typically inaccessible. Providing text representations of these is like, a really good way to go. Um, and a lot of the way you can do this is through video captioning, um, and like captioning images through, you know, that you can provide HTML attributes for all of this stuff. Um, and we're seeing a lot of really good stuff with AI auto captioning stuff. I tried out, Microsoft has this thing. Um, I gave it an image of me holding a cat. And it says, I think it's a woman holding a cat. She seems happy. <laughs> Is that you? I think you look 54% like Josh Stewart. <laughs> And it's not, it's not completely wrong. I don't know. I'm not that surly. Um, similarly, Facebook have rolled out this thing where, admittedly, it's for their adverts. So I don't really, like, I'm not fully on board. But um, they're automatically captioning video adverts, which is great. Um, so like web stuff specifically, um, we have a markup language. I think a lot of people approach, especially, you know, I don't know, some engineers really hate. Um, any kind of like style and design, like I shouldn't have to learn CSS. Um, but I think a lot of people use the markup language from a point of view of um, like visual display. And actually it provides a huge amount of um, structure there that helps assistive technology and like general accessibility concerns. If you compare this to like um, a format like PDF, which is how I've put my slides together so not very accessible, but like HTML actually provides a huge amount of structure for people to get at the content that you're trying to put across. Um, and one thing that the W3C specs like put across is trying to separate in your mind the idea of content structure and presentation. So um, if with the example of like an H2 tag, for example, um, the actual like words that you're putting in like I don't know, new comment um, is the content. The structure is that it's in the, like this H2 tag and that it's like a heading um, in like the context of the rest of the document. And the presentation is that, OK, you know, maybe it's like a bit bolder, it's a bit bigger, it stands out a little bit, it's got some margin on it. Um, so yeah, HTML has a lot of accessibility features built in. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them and tell you like how to do this stuff. It's actually really easy to um, look up. A good example of this, and this is actually the um, the example that I get trolled with Capybara for all the time. Like I say, I want to fill in car description with whatever. Um, the for attribute on a label corresponds to the ID attribute on the input. It's like Super simple, but putting that together means that you can have your label somewhere else on the page, and your input like will be linked up to it. It'll have that context, um, stuff like that. There's some as well. 
you can get trolled by. I thought that this was really great, and then I found out that it's not supported by anybody. Um, so in HTML5, they introduced these like things for describing the structure of your documents. So like headers, this is a header, this is a footer, this is like some kind of section. Um, they're not supported by browsers or by assistive technology at all. Um, so there's like even audit software out there now that will go through your website and check that you're not doing this stuff. Um, because it will come out as a completely flat document with no structure in it whatsoever. Um, so the suggestion is that if you're going to use section, you should like um, use still h1, h2, h3, h4 to determine like this is the nested content of my structure. Um, web accessibility. I actually really don't like um, like formal documents, spec documents, whatever it is. They're all super boring. But this was actually really interesting to read, um, and it's actually quite short. Um, there's like 14 guidelines, they have a list of checkpoints for each guideline that you can go through and just say, like, does it do this? Does it do this? Does it do this? It tells you, like, what priority you should be, like, you know, how much you should care about this stuff. And it gives you techniques for how to do it um, and tells you, like, what the current support is. So, like, if you don't own a Braille keyboard, it will tell you, oh, this isn't, like, really supported very much by anybody. Um, so, and also there's, like, a little bit of arcane stuff, like frames and image maps, which I'm pretty sure nobody like ever uses these days. So um, I'm just going to quickly blitz through these because there's only 14 of them, and you know we should all know these. Uh, the first is provide equivalent alternatives to auditory visual content. Um, this is stuff like alt attributes. There's a long desk attribute you can use as well, providing captions and an auditory track. These are all like recommendations here. Don't rely on color alone. Um, you can like, um, yeah, this is to do with being like colorblind or visually impaired. If you like, if color is the thing that's like actually presenting your content, that's a big no-no. Um, use markup and style sheets and do so properly. So this is partly like, don't use a table to like decide the structure of your entire website, or even better, like you know, just make an image of the thing that you're wanting to like display and put it. I don't think anybody does that anymore, but like that's part of the recommendation. Um, natural language uses, you can actually like specify what language your content is in. So if you've got a text to speech thing, it can like switch into Spanish mode by just saying, hey, I'm, this bit's in Spanish. And like stuff like that is super important. Um, you can also like if you're providing an abbreviation that's not clear, you can like there's markup for providing an expansion of what that is. Um, creating tables that transform gracefully. They talk about transforming gracefully a lot, and I don't really know what it means. Um, but things like you can use the th field to indicate that this is a heading, um, and yeah, t head, t body, t foot. Use them to group. Bros, like it's, it's simple stuff, but it actually helps people out a lot. Um, ensure that pages featuring new technologies transform gracefully. This is another thing. Um, new technology is apparently JavaScript. Um, yeah. Um, but I guess the question is, can your website work without style sheets? Can it work without JavaScript? Um, and are your event handlers device independent? So this is like what I was saying about clicks and stuff like that. That's not necessarily device independent. Um, ensure that control of time sensitive content changes. This says stuff like don't use marquee or like blink. Um, this, so yeah, I'm breaking all the rules. Um, no flickering. You want to be able to like stop pages that auto update. Um, if people are like really slowly moving through the page and your page is like changing at a million miles an hour or like auto refreshing, that's really annoying. So providing people the opportunity to pause that is great. Um, ensure direct accessibility of embedded user interfaces. So um, I don't actually have any notes about this. I think this is like if you've got like a video. Great. Given, Object tag. Given when um, design for device independence. Um, 
logical event handlers. So we, we said about that, like, don't use event handlers that are terrible. Tab index is like a thing that you can say to be like, I'm navigating the page by just hitting tab. Um, is your form, like, or all your form elements appearing in a natural order? I mean, I think that's just like not being really annoying. Like, even as somebody who's like very able at using websites, I can hit tab and still get infuriated by things. Um, keyboard shortcuts are like actually massively helpful to people besides just like, you know, navigating GitHub. Um, you can, like a lot of people, especially people using switches, will define macros. So it's not just a thing of like, oh, I have to like hit tab eight times. Like they'll just like define a macro that takes them to this page and does this thing that they want to do. Um, so like actually providing keyboard shortcuts that are sensible in your website is just massively useful again. Um, Using interim solutions, again, super vague sounding thing, but they have loads of instructions about it. This is things like um, doing the right thing with your labels, so providing labels for your forms, setting them out properly. Um, yeah, and this is actually like, so this is for like technology that hasn't caught up. So assistive tech, sometimes if you've got like a bunch of links um, that are in a line together, they'll actually like read them all out as one, just like one big thing. Um, so I don't know how much that's the case anymore because I, like, I like to think that the stuff that like, Chrome and Apple are doing here is just totally up to date. Nathan's shaking his head. Maybe not. Um, <coughs> use W3C technologies. You're part of the club now. Um, so they say stuff like don't use Shockwave, don't use PDF, it's really inaccessible. Um, use MathML and HTML and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I'm preaching to the choir, I think. Uh, provide content and orient context and orientation information. Um, so this is stuff like the title attribute. Um, I, I'm pretty sure every Ember app I've ever made just has the same title attribute for every single page. Um, I don't know. Has anybody put any effort into changing their titles? I don't like. Um, that also applies to like if you've got a group of options, you can use like an opt group element to like group them all together. Um, and similarly, like form content can be grouped together using field set and legend. Um, clear navigation mechanisms is like an obvious thing. Provide good link text. Um, it says stuff like navigation bars are, are good for people, obviously. I think, I think a lot of this stuff is pretty obvious. Um, think about providing a sitemap. Um, and a lot of screen readers, for example, when you're navigating a website through a screen reader, I don't know if you've ever, like, if you see somebody who's a total pro at it, they'll like, they're very quick at just recognizing from the start of a link or the start of a heading, like, nah, this content's not for me. Um, so if it's like, this is a picture of blah, 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 like, that's not massively helpful. So try and put like the, the actual content that you're putting across, like, right at the beginning, like, front load it. Um, finally, ensure that documents are clear and simple. Um, this is just the thing of just like, make sure your language is simple and clear. Um, don't be too complicated. What I'm not touching on here is this like slightly bigger thing, um, which is really cool. Again, um, this is specifically for like rich internet applications. There's a group of people putting together guidelines and whenever you see like ARIA stuff and you're kind of like, what's all that? Um, it's a, a lot of what my understanding is that it's for like saying, this like really random little component that I've made, it does this kind of thing. Um, so that's an interesting one to read up on for sure. Um, W3C is on GitHub, who knew? Um, there's loads of stuff there. Like, um, there's also a Slack channel. Ryan Florence, I think, is in it, maybe. We'll see. Um, there's a talk that Jamie White gave at the London Ember meetup. I recommend, I've not been able to find a recording of it, but there are um, slides with lots of links. I've basically copied all of the links and content in his talk and put it in my talk. Um, so these are all fantastic talks that you can check out. Um, they're slightly English centric. Um, a lot of these people are English, um, which I can only say is a good thing. BBC provide <laughs> um, a lot of guidance on how to um, 
make your website accessible. So did the UK government, actually. They, like, the guys at, uh, this is the government digital service, have a load of amazing stuff, um, open source stuff. I'm sure you've all seen them before. Um, but they also have some accessibility guidelines. They're very good. Um, on the topic of working out if your website is accessible, I think a lot of people know that you can just manually verify stuff. Um, and there's like varying degrees of effort that you can put in. Um, one of these is just like try navigating with a keyboard, like put your mouse aside. You know, if you feel like a pro hacker, you can do everything with a keyboard, right? Um, screen readers actually is really easy to turn on in OS X and in your like iPhone, probably Android. I don't know. Um, just try it out. Like see see what that feels like. See what that navigation flow is. Even if you just do it once, you'll like very clearly, very quickly see this is really painful. Um, try disabling style sheets. Does it like, is the order of the content sensible? Um, text only browsers, I, I wouldn't recommend using links, but um, see what you could do to like actually just pull out the, the text content itself and see if that's sensible. I was very inaccessible a few years ago, well, like a long time ago when I was trying to like set up some kind of extremely custom Linux distribution and like I just couldn't use the internet, so links was my only option and yeah. Um, also, just make your resolution really small, see what that looks like. Um, some people were using like really beefed up font sizes and stuff, so um, this is, I guess, kind of like testing for mobile, but um, if you've got a responsive website, maybe that'll help. There's a bunch of accessibility tools on GitHub, this link, um, check it out. It's like the most interesting stuff I think is like audit tools, um, but there's like jQuery stuff, um, there's links to um, all sorts of different, I don't know, check it out. There's um, one of the resources that's there is like, most of these are provided by W3C, are like things that will um, tell you what like all of the like English names are and all the different like keyboard codes are. So when you like start mashing your keyboard, and you're trying to add in keyboard shortcuts, this will like tell you what that is. So um, these are useful. Um, audit tools is a massive thing of this. So instead of going through your website and manually checking everything, you can have a, a tool that will just like introduce it to your CI, whatever. It'll automatically go through and point out things that just don't lend well to being accessible. Um, so you can get this like as a browser extension, just like run it as a one-time check or um, install it into your CI. Um, a couple of examples of audit tools that are out there, there are um, some accessibility tools provided by Google. They do lots of stuff, the Chrome team, lots of accessibility stuff there. Um, so you can get that as like a Chrome plugin. Um, you can run it from the command line as well. So. That's super helpful. Oh, I have a video, fancy. So yeah, this introduces like an audit section to your browser panel and you can just like say, right, um, I just wanna audit accessibility and it'll pull up a bunch of like different warnings, different priorities. Um, Axe is another one out there. Um, yeah, we'll see that like it's very popular. Um, Tenon is a third party one you can use as well. They have like a pretty comprehensive suite of checks. I've not tried using it myself, but um, yeah. Uh, there's some framework specific ones you'd be surprised to hear. Um, I've not looked into them massively, except for the Ember one, maybe. Um, yeah, so React and Angular all have their things. Um, I think Ember A11Y testing is using Axe. Is that right? That's right. Okay, cool. So yeah, um, the idea here is that you can just install this, drop this in, and it's like ready with everything you're doing. I'll get onto that, that stuff. Um, I guess I'll get onto it now. How can we make Ember.js accessible? So there's a lot of like big gains that we can make from having this framework, having these like common practices. Everybody all works in the same way, so you know, um, it's like pretty easy to distribute stuff like this Ember A11Y testing, which just like everybody downloads it. I hope you all download it tonight and just start putting it into your CI tools. 
Um, we have like an accessibility team. So this is a team of people getting together, um, complimenting each other about once a fortnight. Um, we all get very confused about different ways of speaking English. Um, we've put together, oh, this is the team. There's some people there. Um, there's Embraer 11 wire testing. We're putting that into like the domain of um, this group. Um, I'm thinking about putting together like a colorblind simulator. Uh, I, like, I've played around with WebGL filters, and they're kind of easy enough. But like, I don't know if you can just apply it to a whole web page very easily. If anybody like wants to come and hack on this with me, um, yeah, do come up and say hello. Um, I'm sure you could probably do it with CSS or something. Either, either way, I'm sure. Like, Eric's CSS stuff, maybe. <laughs> no, no. Um, template, template linting is a massive um, boon. Uh, we're seeing this come more and more into um, more into the spotlight. Um, we held uh, a hack day at Zesty and did a bit of work on that, and we've just seen it like move forward from there. Um, actually, this is one area that if everybody's got template linting installed, we can just like start giving advice to people about how to how to do accessibility for their templates. They're like very specific handlebars advice. Um, the other thing that I have to say is that like already you've got valid HTML or like your, your divs are going to be closed and stuff like that just from using Ember. So that's that's great. Um, fast boot. We say about like JavaScript being a super modern technology, and you should try your website without it. But like, actually, we can kind of. Fast boot should be like a way of getting yourself together a nice little HTML page. Um, your website will be like more accessible just by like dropping it in. I hope. I, I know it's not like waving a magic wand. Maybe it is. Um, and similarly, like I'm interested in exploring how we can look at actions. Um, you know, like, are we being irresponsible with like a click event handler? Um, does the like native Ember input um, helper just like do the right thing? Uh, this is like something where we can look at making Ember a bit better for this stuff. Um, page titles as well. I looked into this having never set up a page title. It's actually really, really easy. There's um, there's this add-on, and you just install it. You say, "Hey, look, give me a title," and they even like nest them with your nested roots. So it's beautiful, like really easy to do. Um, if any of you are interested in getting involved, we have um, a Slack channel um, where like all the people from Ember A11Y we're, we're chilling out there, we're lurking. Um, this is on the Ember.js community Slack channel. You can get to that through the Ember.js website. Um, we're putting together a demo app. Um, and this is mainly with the intention of providing a space for people who are developing assistive technologies to come along and just test Ember out. So we're like, we've got loads of examples of um, typical uses of like standard Ember.js um, and like a collection of the like really common um, add-ons that are out there that people are using. Um, and part of the intention here is that we should be able to like, really quickly spot any areas where we're, like, we're not doing things as well as we could. Um, I think one thing that I'm personally extremely excited about is in two days, this is on Thursday, there is like, this Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, and we're, uh, yeah, as a community, I, like, I'm hoping we get loads of Ember.js people to like, muck in. Um, and like, you know, take the day out to like. If you can convince your your boss to say like, right, today I'm going to work on like getting accessibility together for our website or helping out with some of these um, community contributions. Um, have a look at the Ember.js blog. Um, there's a post from today. Nathan, over here, do talk to him. Tell him all his like spelling errors and stuff. Um, there's a bunch of links on there for like ways that you can get involved. Um, they are offering pairing sessions. So you can just like go onto the website, sign up, organize a pairing session with one of us. 
Um, there's also like a mailing list and stuff, so have a look at that. Um, and there's like all sorts of talks, panels, things happening. You can have a look at the like Global Accessibility Awareness Day website. Um, there's going to be a talk from like Google I/O that I'm excited about seeing. Um, yeah, loads of loads of cool stuff. Uh, this is my desktop. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want to see what this looks like with a screen reader. Can you imagine? <sighs> Torture. Uh, just for Dropbox that automatically organizes all the screenshots. That sounds good. That sounds good. I'm trying to get it to fill up as much as possible. Like it's kind of I don't know on a small screen it looks much better. Yeah. Um, any questions? Two questions. What do you think the lowest, like what's the easiest thing that somebody can do if they have an hour to increase the accessibility of their website? Uh, so the question is, what's the easiest thing that somebody could do if they have an hour to like improve the accessibility of their website? Um, I think personally the best thing to do besides like hooking up, I mean you could just hook up Ember 11Y testing into your CI. Um, and then you'd like reap the benefits of annoying all of your colleagues. Um, <laughs> but personally, I think uh, just going through with a keyboard, trying to like tab through, see like what everything looks like. Um, turn on the like the screen reader. Um, just browse through your website. Try it out. It's horrible. Yes. Uh, if you want to use a screen reader and get an idea of like, or some of these system technologies and get an idea of what a great experience is like, like what a best-in-class experience is like, what would you go and look at? Good question. Um, so the question was, if you wanted to see a real like best-in-class experience of using a screen reader, where would you go? What would that look like? Um, my answer is that I have no idea, but um, Nathan might have an idea. Facebook. Facebook. Facebook's really good apparently. Um, yeah. Uh, so like, yeah, go have a look at Facebook. I've heard that Facebook is actually also really good on mobile. Um, so that's like double accolade right there. Okay, great.